Swidler, the chair of Genetic ALS and FTD and the Legacy, a uh, patient-led organization dedicated solely to the needs and interests of the genetic ALS and FTD community. We are so happy to be hosting Dr. Kiernan for this talk. Um, I'm sure uh, there'll be time for our Q&A at the end, so please feel free to type those into chat and um, we'll get to them at the end. And I think uh, the, uh, Dr. Kiernan might even uh, allow some questions in the middle if it uh, comes up. So with that, I'll kick it to you, uh, Dr. Kiernan. And I did want to note that it is being recorded and will be available on YouTube later. So uh, thank you so much again, Doctor. Okay, well, look, thanks, uh, Jean, and thanks to And the Legacy for, for the invitation to join you. It's the, in the morning Friday here in Sydney. Uh, I know it's your afternoon on Thursday, so we're ahead of you. Um, but I've been following, obviously, the progress of And the Legacy through uh, social media and, and Jean's uh, activities, and I congratulate you on the efforts that you've done. Um, I, was, I listened to your uh planning and discussion for the FDA for the FDA meeting and I think that's exact that was a, a great initiative and I think everyone in the the general community uh, welcomes your advocacy so from my perspective I'm a neurologist based in Sydney um, I, I manage uh, or look after or care for 250 ALS patients uh, we have a multidisciplinary service with allied healthcare um and a research um linked to the clinical service and we're involved in in clinical trials i suppose i'm not sure about the situation in america but this is an ad hoc arrangement so this is only through personal interest that we have a clinic so there's no hardwire clinical services for als in australia um, they develop really through support of the community so so my clinic is supported through philanthropy and industry involvement, particularly through through clinical trials. So I think that the um, ALS community has has come to the fore really through a number of, of uh, initiatives. And I think the ice bucket challenge was really critical in raising awareness at a global level. Um, and we see many of the, uh, in a local region, K-pop got heavily involved and that really promoted it. Um, in, our, in our region, we've been um, very much supported through philanthropy and and I would like to mention Neil Danner who, who set up um, Fight MND, came from a very famous footballing family and, and they have generated through the football community so far about $80 million um, which has driven so much uh, clinical progress at a global level but also uh, particularly in Australia and has supported a number of initiatives and a number of doctoral and postdoctoral students um, and, and allied healthcare training. And I think, um, <clears throat> interestingly, this was written up in Lancet Neurology this year, a, a few months ago, and the, the, the article is called A Spirited Community That Knows How to Fight. And Neil says, partnerships between clinical researchers and fight MND in his case, have been instrumental in highlighting the clinical research capacity and capability. So I think that's an example of, a, of an excellent uh, partnership. Well, I suppose the real problem that has slowed us all down is we don't really understand how the disease begins. And, and obviously there are scientific models um, and how much that they translate into the actual human disease that is ALS is, is really unclear. And I think a lot of the research that we need to pursue more carefully is the research in, 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 in humans. And, and that critically involves asymptomatic individuals. So in our region, we've, we established in 2015 the Pan-Asian Consortium for the Treatment and Research in ALS. I suppose uh, there was a feeling of disenfranchisement from uh, this geographical region, particularly the Asian community. Um, they felt that there was obviously a great focus for North America and a great focus for Europe, but in, in actual fact, Asia accounts for three-fifths of the world population and there was no representation. And so PACDALS has really uh, taken off with great support through all of the regional uh, initiatives. And obviously we have a great spread of developed countries such as Japan and Korea um, and, and very um, you know, poorly developed countries and initiatives. And, and I think Indonesia, Malaysia, um, India all struggle with, with the care of and, and you know, awareness of ALS. But I suppose bringing this all together, we were able to 
Um, and this is an example of an initiative you can do at a large scale with this sort of population approach. So we combined the Japanese, Korean and Australian cohorts, so 6,500 uh, ALS patients in Australia, 2,200 in Japan and 3,000 South Korean and looked at the a model of the age of onset versus the incidence. And this had come from initially from cancer studies and obviously then a European study, uh, which had been driven through uh, Amar al Chalabi. And we looked at the same things, basically the age of incidence versus the age of onset. And it's a straight line and the slope of that relationship is six. So that means that six things have to happen for an individual to develop ALS. Um, and for finer discussion, if, if, if an individual carries the genetic mutation linked to one of the conditions, that accounts for three of the steps. But that means that they have to be exposed to another three steps to manifest the disease. And those steps are unknown at this stage, but also they don't need to be sequential. So you don't need to go step four, step five, step six. It could be step five, step six, step four. So it's, it could be seemingly random, um, but that's the level of intuition that comes from mathematical modeling. And I'd like to put a plug in now for the Pan-Asian meeting, which will be held later this year in September. And Notina Sharazela is the chair and president of the meeting, and that will be held in Malaysia. The last meeting that we held in Nagoya in Japan had 1,800 registrants, so it's much bigger than the international uh, symposium. So we don't know how the disease begins, but I suppose the question is, when does it begin? And Ineda Miyoshi was an occupational therapist working with us. She had developed the um, FTD functional scale and she wanted to, we were very fortunate that she came to Australia for an extended period and did a postdoc with us. And she started interviewing um, partners and family members of patients with ALS. And this is her sort of finding. So basically, we know at the sort of the stage when patients develop weakness and eventually obviously breathing difficulties, but the, the partners and family members of patients were reporting changes in their personality for many years beforehand, up to about five years. And here are some of the things that the partners of patients had noticed, that they were making suggestive remarks, using catchphrases, they're impulsive. But I think one of the key areas is a decline in motivation. And we might use the word apathy. So that, that apathy is something that links all of human neurodegenerative diseases. So in Parkinson's disease, in, in dementia, this is a common sort of finding. So I think we're seeing commonality across a number of these uh, conditions. Now, this is more hypothesis driven than reality, but so we know that there's a period in adult life when the disease begins, but what we really don't know is what has gone on all the way from conception through birth, adolescence and early adulthood. And part of the discussion is that in the brain, uh, the normal brain is that the brain is very excitatory. And then in the first few periods after the neonatal brain has been set up and then through early uh, early life, inhibition goes across the brain. And we know that clinically. So for instance, when you stroke the foot of a newborn baby, their toe goes up, that's a Babinski sign. And then gradually in the uh, first sort of six to 12 months, the toe goes down and that's inhibition has settled across the human nervous system. And then if someone has an acute event like a stroke, one of the features are that this sort of manifestation of excited, excitability is evident. So there's an upgoing toe. And we notice these similar changes in ALS. And so the question is, is it some sort of balance between excitation and inhibition that is part of the key process of the manifestation of the disease. So perhaps something is not working at 100% and it's compensated through most of your adult life, through adolescence, through early um, adulthood, into mid-adulthood, mid and then those compensatory mechanisms run out and ultimately the disease starts to manifest. So I suppose um, from, from my perspective, when I started in this field, there were, no, there were no genetics known about ALS or FTD. Clearly we knew there were families. So in fact, there were studies um, throughout the uh, 
80s, I was involved in those studies of family understanding, the trying to understand the families in Australia. And in fact, we identified and linked those families back to the European uh, mi migration. So we had the links to families, particularly uh, in Northern and Western Europe, and particularly through the United Kingdom. And a lot of these studies then led to eventually the unlocking of the first gene superoxide dismutase. But obviously we've had a lot of genes which have been discovered since then. And, and clearly the most significant of those genes is C9 open reading frame 72 or C9 off. And I suppose um, people knew that there was an overlap between ALS and frontotemporal dementia. And this is one of the sort of the key groups who'd been studying this in the 80s in, in Manchester, David Neary and Julie Snowden. But they were sort of going against an argument and part of the sort of the fundraising for the ALS community was imagine, and this came from David Niven, who was the, the key uh, sort of philanthropy approach in the UK. And he would say, imagine how bad it is being locked in your body, but the mind is still intact. And, that, and these, this group who was studying cognition felt that they didn't want to, you know, unearth some of these discussions because they felt that there would be a community backlash. But their studies, which were published in the 80s, dementia of the frontal type and frontolobal dementia and motor neuron disease have become citation classics, published in 1990, 1994. But this is their text. I asked them to come back and review their contributions and, and give an insight. And they said they noticed there were behavioural changes, but the prospect of mental change would add further burden to people who were faced with MND. Really, um, the thing that has, has sort of transformed this field was obviously the discovery of C9 Orpha that was done simultaneously by two groups through the Mayo and through NIH. And this is a personal reflection from Brian Trainer. And obviously the first sort of understanding came through a, a sporadic ALS clinic in Finland and they found that 48% of sporadic ALS all carried this gene. So in fact, they were all clearly related. But when you say, why didn't they know that they had this family history? Well, this is going back, you know, more than a thousand years. So every time this gene is, is found, the original Finnish founder or haplotype is identified, the original individual. So they're all related to this individual. And you know that, you know, your parents and your grandparents, after your grandparents, it's hard to really know too much about your family history. And that must be part of the contributing factor. But interestingly, it does show then the migration through Western Northern Europe and then migration to the United States and migration to Australia. And we, we all have the same sort of genetic backgrounds. Interestingly, and this is something that we've seen through PACDELS, c 9 off is not really an issue in Asian populations. It's very rare, less than a percent. Um, and SOD1 is far more frequent, and there's clearly many more genes that are yet to be discovered uh, through the Asian region. So this is a presentation of a patient with motor neuron disease. <clears throat> and the discussion is that this muscle here is a critical part of understanding it. So this is first dorsal interossei, which is an ulna innervated muscle. And another muscle, which is innervated by the ulna nerve is normal. That's a ductal digit minimi. So it's not an ulna nerve presentation, but this muscle in the thumb is also wasted. That's called the ductal pollicis brevis. And really this is showing what is called the ALS split hand. And this means that the, the process cannot be coming from a peripheral nerve. It can't be coming from the spinal cord. It's coming from somewhere higher than the spinal cord. And the key area is the motor homunculus. So this is the representation of the motor cortex in the human brain. And we see a massive representation of the thumb and the uh, index finger. And that is one of the most common presentations of motor neuron disease. And that is, we are the only uh, species, mammalian species, who can do a pincer grip. So we're, we're the only ones who can hold a pencil, uh, hold a credit card, shake hands, etc. Interestingly, the other massive representation on the human motor homunculus is, is the bulbar region. And again, the bulbar region is key to the onset of motor neuron disease. So this, this huge motor network, it's interesting that that's where the key presentations of ALS uh, develop. 
And this is a, a, we went to Yankee Stadium a number of years ago and I was looking at a photo of uh, Luke Gehrig and you can see he has the, here he is with Babe Ruth, he has the ALS split hand and we, we wrote that up as, as a discussion point. And that gives you some idea also about the spread of the disease. That was his left hand. His disease began in his left foot. He had trouble running to first base and then the disease spread to involve his, his left hand. This homunculus has been, has been relatively unex, underexplored, but I think these are the areas that we need to focus on to really try and understand causation and spread of disease. The homunculus was developed by Penfield. In, he was a surgeon and he was doing epilepsy surgery. And by opening up the brain, he started stimulating parts of the brain and working out where they were represented. But no one has had a good look at the lower motor neuron. And this is a recent publication in Brain by John Rabbits. And he came up with this sort of consideration of a lower motor neuron homunculus. But what I would say is this is based purely on anatomy. And we subsequently wrote in to Brain to say that whilst that's an interesting concept, function is more appropriate to consider than, than pure anatomical or, or, or histological representation. And I think it's by understanding function that we're going to understand human disease, particularly motor neuron disease. So again, in my own experience, when I started in neurology, ALS was regarded as a neuromuscular disease, solely neuromuscular. In fact, that's how I got into the area because I was doing neuromuscular medicine and neurophysiology. But this area here had been very much un unexplored. And there were individuals, Andrew Eisen, one in particular, who suggested that maybe motor neuron disease or ALS was beginning in the brain. And this was regarded almost like heresy and, and, and people did not like that discussion. But I think we're seeing more and more of the parts of the jigsaw coming through to show that ALS is a primary neurodegenerative process that begins in the brain. We don't know the mechanism of excitotoxic spread. There is somehow passage through into the other compartment of the human motor system, into the lower motor neuron, and then the manifestation of the disease is typically wasting and muscle weakness, functional loss and, and respiratory problems. And I suppose you could ask, well, why, why is there so little understood about this upper motor neuron and, and pathways? Well, really, we don't have great tools. So to be honest, the way that we assess the upper motor neuron still in clinical medicine is we have a tendon hammer and we tap on the reflexes. And if, the re if we think the reflexes are brisk, we say, well, there's upper motor neuron involvement. That's how basic the, the process is. And this is very well reviewed by Michael Swash. Obviously, we hoped that MRI would, would really advance the field as it has in other areas like multiple sclerosis, where it's purely a diagnostic tool, but we can also manage the, the relapses based on MRI findings. Occasionally with ALS patients, you see the signal change involving the corticospinal tract, but that's rare. So we've also been looking at ways to quantitate the corticospinal tract, looking at the volume. So for instance, if the volume of the corticospinal tract is reduced by 30% and on the corresponding side, there's weakness of the left hand, would that be diagnostic of ALS? And these at the moment are still research approaches. So we were keen to look at the motor function, the function of the brain itself. And it's very hard. One of the ways you can do it is through magnetic stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is Steve Vucic, who was doing his PhD with me at the time. And this is an individual who has familial, uh, it carries a gene linked to motor neuron disease. An older sister had died of bulbar onset disease. A younger sister had leg onset disease and he was asymptomatic. So even if you have this, the same genetic mutation can result in different clinical presentations. And we wanted to look at the whole neural axis uh, combining electrical approaches, but also spinal information and, and the brain. And I won't get into this too much, but if you put two impulses close to each other, there's a period of inhibition of the brain followed by facilitation. So that's normal controls. When you look at sporadic ALS, there is a reduction in this period of inhibition and there's increased facilitation. So the brain is hyper excitable. We were then interested in looking at familial ALS patients because to be honest, we can't distinguish familial ALS from sporadic ALS at a clinical perspective. We can only do it when we know the family history. And some people have wondered whether it really was the same disease. So this is uh, 
a, a group of 10 familial patients, um, and they show the same changes, reduction in inhibition and increase in facilitation. Um, and so we've gone on to use this as a biomarker of, of a diagnostic biomarker. And this is a large study of 330 patients that Parvati Menon published in the Lancet Neurology. And we've given various criteria. And now we're trying to make that technology more globally accessible. And I suppose that that's our struggle. So when we started doing these studies, uh, we were very much supported by the ALS community and asymptomatic individuals who carried genetic mutations wanted to be involved in research and it was through their generosity they would come every six to 12 months and they still do um, for assessments and this is one of the cases that we saw it was a, a um, asymptomatic individual she was in her 40s um, and she had normal cortical function and then a year later there was a reduction in inhibition and because this is a research study, we uh, this is the first time we'd uh, encountered this. We didn't know what it meant, and we wanted to see, um, you know, we, we'd get it back and, and follow it through and see what happened. I mean, it could have been just an aberration. But about two months after this study, she rang up and said that she was on a walking tour to Tasmania, and she noticed that her leg was, she had a foot drop. And so we asked her to come back in. And then we looked at both sides of the motor cortex and the left motor cortex was normal, but the right motor cortex had significantly reduced inhibition and she had weakness of a left leg. So it looks like this made sense. Um, but because again, this is the first time we'd encountered it, we obviously went and did a full workup for neurological conditions for, for leg weakness. And this was a muscle biopsy and this showed type one and type two atrophy which is diagnostic of of ALS so she had developed ALS and I suppose I bring this up because there had been some discussion which I have seen on on social media about you know should should asymptomatic individuals be treated with the medications uh, that are available and of course we support this process but we're, we're clinicians and we don't have um, the, the sway of government authorities or, or in industry involvement. But what we did say, and this is the article that was published in 2008, if earlier cortical abnormalities could be reliably identified, institution of neuroprotective agents at that stage, including anti-glutamate agents such as Rilizol, may slow disease progression. A further argument could be, well, should everyone be on these agents, you know, through their adult life? And I suppose these are things that need to be considered. I mean, it's un it's it's unknown. And and as a person, as a person working in the field, I wouldn't know what to suggest to those individuals. Um, and these are things that will only need to really be worked out through research and through a combined, um, you know, community of of individuals, patients, and uh, clinicians. But I suppose um, those original studies were in superoxide dismutase because the, the C9 gene hadn't been discovered at that stage. We've done subsequent studies in C9, and they show, again, this reduction in inhibition. And similarly, with fused in sarcoma or FUS mutations, they have the uh, same changes. Now, that's a functional approach. Another approach is obviously the spread of pathology in the brain. And this is originally coming through the BRAC group and, and the ULM uh, uh, clinicians and researchers. And there seems to be a proposal of a corticofugal spread. In other words, fugo means to flee. So moving out of the brain, spreading out of the brain. And there are various stages that have been identified initially in the motor system, posterior frontal regions, then spreading more into the internal mechanisms of the brain, temporal lobe and, and hippocampus. And we have a similar program here. We have a large brain bank. Uh, we have about 330 uh, generous individuals who've donated their brains and spinal cords having been managed by us in a, in a clinic and that forms a resource that's available at a global level for uh, groups to, to utilise. But this is a study from Rachel Tan looking at FTD and ALS and one of the key determinants is whether TDP43 is in the hypoglossal nucleus, and that's 100% uh, sensitivity for the diagnosis of ALS, and less, it rarely happens in frontotemporal dementia. 
So we know that the, the gene is spread through FTD and ALS. Um, these are the groups as, at, a, at a clinical level, once they have manifest disease, these are very uh, complex patients and often difficult to manage. They're difficult for the partners and family members. Um, and unfortunately, the prognosis tends to generally be worse. So this is a C9 family that we manage, and here you can see a number of the individuals have ALS, but there's also in that same in that same generation, there's an individual here who has frontotemporal dementia, and obviously we could focus on those. But once you start to open it up to other brain and mind conditions, so if you ask about history of significant depression, as evidenced here, schizophrenia. Um, and other, other mind conditions, uh, bipolar disease and autism spectrum. So there seems to be a greater manifestation of brain and mind conditions in the families who are linked to C9. And so Emma Devaney is a neurologist who works with us and she did a study of 1,414 family members um, of C9 kindreds and this is published in Neurology. But I just mentioned here that there's the relative risk for autism spectrum disease is much higher in C9 carriers than non-carriers as evidenced here, but it's also much more increased in, in sporadic um, FTD as opposed to ALS. So there's, there's linkages between these human motor neurodegenerative diseases and dementia with other conditions such as autism spectrum and other mood related conditions, including psychosis, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. So they're all increased in families who carry mutations of C9. I suppose the next question is, well, okay, if you discover this process of altered motor function, does it really mean anything? And Kazumoto Shibuya was a Japanese neurologist who worked with us and looked at in a cohort of 216 referrals. And those individuals had reduction in inhibition, had a much greater uh, and, and more rapid progression uh, in their disease. So it does seem to be linked to the progression of the disease. And Mana Hagishihara is another Japanese neurologist who spent a postdoc period working with us, looked at cognitive function and, and motor cortical dysfunction and found that they were clearly linked and progressing with each other. And I suppose that doesn't really, that, that makes sense and shouldn't be too, um, too much of a surprise that if you have a, a protein change that's linked to cognitive problems, and motor dysfunction, that they're all going to be linked in outcome measures. And sure enough, that is the case. And here's an example of a sort of a forest fire that is spread through through a forest uh, here, here in Australia. And I bring this up as an analogy. So at the moment, we're thinking that disease transmission spread is very much driven through pathology by TDP43. And perhaps that TDP43 changes links to changes in function and hyperexcitability. But I suppose an alternative consideration would be that there's a functional change in the brain first, and that spreads through a hyperexcitability, and then ultimately you see later on the pathological change. So the analogy would be that a forest fire is spreading through, and then after the forest fire, sure enough, you see charred uh, trees, and, and that would be the analogy that I would use. And I think function may well be more important than pathology, and there are examples in nature. So this is a, a pulsar, so a dying star. And as a star dies, it releases energy and has hyperexcitability. And then when the star has died, there's a black hole. So the functional changes are preceding the, uh, the physical changes, um, which is at this stage an hypothesis, but that's something that we're working on uh, presently. In terms of treatment, well, I think that SOD1 uh, was important in terms of trying to work out a mechanism of spread of the disease and redox system was linked to glutamate and individual groups, um, including Jeff Rothstein and Pam Shaw at CSF of ALS patients and found glutamate was increased and they came up with the excitotoxic theory that somehow the motor neuron is triggered off and that leads to the release of glutamate and then glutamate is toxic to motor neurons and that's leads to the cascade of cell death. 
And that ultimately was the basis for the discovery of the clinical trials in Rilizol, which was the first FDA approved therapy. People don't really understand how glutamate works and it has a lot of different mechanisms, both through glutamate, but also through various channels, um, including sodium channels and calcium channels in the brain. We wanted to see individuals soon after they were diagnosed with, with ALS and then commenced on Rilizol. And you can see here there's reduction in inhibition. And when individuals are started on Rilizol, they get a pseudo normalization. So it starts to approach normal for a short period, but it doesn't ever approach, it doesn't ever become normal. And then gradually that effect wears off over a period of six to, to nine months, at least at a brain motor functional level. Interestingly, this was a study that came out from the King's database showing that Riliazole has benefit at all stages of the disease, stage one, two, three, and four of ALS. And we were asked to review this and write an editorial. And one of the things I'm wondering is whether, whether Riliazole has more effect initially at the earlier stages of the disease through motor pathways in the brain. We also know that it has an effect on sodium channels at a peripheral lower motor neuron level. And perhaps it's that effect that is supporting respiratory function in the later stages of the disease. Um, now I've touched on this already, but as a clinician, we only see patients once they're presented with motor weakness and the survival tends to be two to three years. As I said, we don't really know too much in the preamble, but that's why uh, your group and, and various initiatives around the world are critically important. And I suppose the, the real uh, boon uh, in recent times has been the publication of the Perferson study um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, the antisense oligonucleotide. And I suppose it was originally published more as a sort of a borderline, possibly negative study, but then subsequently, obviously through the open label extension, neurofilament has uh, been shown to be dropping. And then everyone is waiting uh, with beta breath to see what the uh, publication of the clinical results will be. Is that associated with increasing function? Certainly there are anecdotal reports, but at this stage, um, those results have not been published. But critically, what that means is that all individuals who present with a condition should undergo genetic testing. And we've, we've been doing that here for more than a decade, but that's been done on a research basis. Um, it's not supported through, through any formal process. And in fact, we started up a consortia that's been driven particularly by Angela Genge, and we advocated through this commentary in Brain last year that everyone should be offered genetic testing. We know that in our Australian cohort, about 7% of sporadic patients will have a C9, a mutation of C9 off. But you see, when you hear these discussions, so talking to my colleagues working in South America, there's no genetic testing available. They can only pursue it through research collaborations, and that involves sending samples. Sending samples is very difficult at a regulatory uh, level. Governments don't like it. And, and these are things that we could all work on, but be basically trying to increase the accessibility of, of genetic testing. Um, the other therapy, uh, that has come through is obviously Daravone and through Mitsubishi Pharma. And this is through a reassessment of a initially perceived a negative study, but showing a potential benefit for younger onset individuals who have normal respiratory uh, uh, function. I suppose the interesting thing is these studies were undertaken only in Japanese individuals. And part of the uh, disagreement with, for instance, the European um, agencies for drug approval is that there haven't been any appropriate trial studies in people of European uh, racial background. And these are some of the discussions that we all get caught in. And this is now Amalex. Obviously, it's available in the United States and Canada. It's not available in Australia. There's a large phase three study underway, the Phoenix trial, and we all look forward to, to seeing those results. Um, the last bit I wanted to just touch on was four clinical trials. This is what we have been doing for the last 20 years. We just get a group of ALS patients and we give them a treatment. 
and we look at the results and and as you know most of them have been negative but there is clearly a need to better stratify individuals through biomarker approaches is that a brain biomarker a spine biomarker or peripheral nerve and i think they're all going to be useful it's a question of what the actual medication is and where does it have its effect and i think this is where we're going now more precision approaches individualized medicine and we're starting this now the lithium trial globally was negative um, but there's been a subsequent study that shows that people at UNC13A did well on lithium. And so we have now started the magnet study working with our colleagues uh, through TRICALS in Europe. Uh, and we've embarked on this now. So every patient in our clinics has, they're offered to participate in biomarker approaches. We have a, a, a national initiative called SOLSA uh, run by Naomi Ray in, in Queensland. And she, phenotypes rank 13A. It looks like it's about 8 to 10% of ALS patients in Australia, and those individuals are offered treatment with lithium as part of their, their clinical management. So, look, I, I would finish by saying um, I would I would praise the uh, and the legacy group for getting um, the, the community together. Um, I would say that we, we, we all work better when we're working together. And I don't think you'll have disagreement from clinicians and researchers. Um, part of the slowness of the process is that everything uh, requires funding and also you need government support and regulatory input. And, and that is what uh, slows us down. But the understanding of ALS is rapidly evolving. We've got much better global networks. So I speak to Jean before the meeting and Zoom. Uh, one thing, one positivity of COVID is that we can meet such as this uh, at short notice and relatively informally. And uh, for instance, for, for me, I don't have any jet lag and, and my family's a lot happier. Um, but this is a, a community more generally. So what I'd like to do is just finish there and open it up for, I'm happy to answer any, any questions. Well, thank you so much, doctor. And we so appreciate you, your colleagues, and the patients who you know, were the, the, the subjects of uh, all those uh, research uh, papers. Um, we have a few questions already, um, so I'll get to those. Uh, a gentleman um, was asking that um, they have a family history of ALS, and their last uh, relative who got gene tested, there was only SOD1, and he's asking, should it, uh, would it make sense if he wanted to pursue testing to, to redo it now if they were only tested for SOD1 and it was negative? Well, absolutely. If there's a family history, um, yes, I would uh, highly recommend uh, the, the person asking the question and, and that group will at least have a discussion. And ideally, these um, they, this testing should be undertaken with a geneticist and a genetic counselor. Um, I, don't, I don't support the, uh, a single you know, neurologist to sending off tests willy nilly. And in fact, they're the guidelines of the Australian Genetics Consortia. So I would, I would recommend through their, G, through their um, local physician, have a discussion with a genetics team and, and have testing for the known genes. And uh, just to put a little color on that, I, I would just add that you, there's probably, if you live in, a, in America and UK and Australia, there's uh, research studies that you could also participate in where it would be free and anonymous and uh, you'd be contributing to, to research too. Which, uh, and you're in Canada, yeah. So um, there's um, GenFi and all FTD are in Canada. I don't think yes. there's yet a, uh, a um, ALS focused one. In Canada, but you might be able to come to the U.S. So uh, we we have that on our site. I'll I'll send the link in of some of these studies. Um, Karen has a question of um, I recently heard about data suggesting lithium may lead to earlier onset of symptoms or progression of disease. Not sure if this is anecdotal or an actual study, but are you familiar with that? I didn't hear what was the progression. What made it uh, go there? Oh, lithium. That li the lithium would be bad. It could could lead to earlier uh, onset. No, well, actually, um, um, a bit of background on lithium. It's an Australian invention um, discovered by John Cade, and he was a um, prisoner of war in Japan. Came back and trained as a psychiatrist and worked in a rural area, and started studies um, and thought that bipolar disease was a chemical problem 
and found that when he when he studied the urine of of uh, bipolar patients and injected that into rats and guinea pigs, they went manic. And then ultimately he tried various things and lithium was one of those areas. So the large studies of lithium in ALS uh, were showed the safety profiles were very good. The, the negative side was it didn't actually, but it didn't, it didn't slow progression of the disease, except in later, later post hoc analysis of um, UNC-13A individuals. What I would say is that lithium needs to be monitored in the blood blood levels, and obviously you don't want to get lithium toxic. The levels in the clinical trials are very low compared to the dosage used for for bipolar disease, and um, there's no this. You're, you're mentioning an anecdotal report. I'm not aware of any anecdotal report, but there are large clinical trials of 700 individuals, and that wasn't an that wasn't a factor. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Um, anecdotally, my my mother was on lithium for 10 to 15 years, and I actually informed the researcher that told me about this. I said, you know, my N of one says that lithium actually was pretty good, and she survived for 22 years after her initial diagnosis. So I personally agree with you, but um, I, I had started to hear about data that was suggesting the opposite, so it surprised me too. Um, one thing, one thing I would mention. Okay. I talked about the six hits hypothesis, and there's been a recent study that showed that there was a higher. And again, this is a study, but it showed a higher incidence of of ALS in individuals who'd undergone electric shock therapy for mood disturbance, and and that might well be one of the hits. Like that could be one of the hits because we know at a very extreme level. If you're hit by lightning, there are case reports of if there are ex entry and exit wounds in an arm, like burn wounds from the lightning or severe electrical trauma, ALS has has commenced subsequently in that same region. So that, that's one of the potential hits. And I think we're going to see that this is a wide variety of hits. We know that in the defense forces, you know, military veterans is a higher incidence. Is that related to blast exposure or some of the chemicals that are released through blast exposure? But whatever it is, there's a higher incidence in, in veterans. Uh, thank you so much. There's a few more in the chat that I'll get to. I'll just jump in with one. Um, the I, I understand that, um, you know, there it might be uh, different approaches needed for most of the disease, but you know, with these TDP43 targeted treatments coming online, you know, and if TDP43 is involved in the pathology, that would be kind of one size fits all. Uh, just uh, any thoughts on that or? Yeah, well, I think that one of the most successful therapies worldwide are humanized monoclonal antibodies across the field. And I don't know whether you saw earlier this week, the Nanomab, which is the monoclonal therapy for Alzheimer's disease directed against amyloid. Um, obviously, Every, like everyone, uh, individuals, family members, and clinicians, we want an even greater effect. But let's face it, if there's a mo humanized monoclonal antibody directed against TDP43, that would be a fantastic uh, chemical. And the next thing would be to do, to do a trial and see, see what comes out. I, I, I think it's inevitable that will form part of the therapy. And a bit like cancer, I think we'll probably have five or six medications that might be efficacious. And then who gets what first up and, and how do you manage these different approaches? It's it's going to be a precision, individualized approach. Uh, it's it's wonderful that you uh, mentioned that. But um, one, one of uh, our, our um, uh, viewers, uh, who's a gentleman with ALS, um, commented that in oncology, it is common to have multiple agents. When can ALS land start using an ASO plus an anti-inflammatory? So that's kind of kind of what you were talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, a big debate on now as well about cocktail approaches. I think cancer is fortunate because usually a diagnosis is reached by they do a tissue biopsy and remove part of the organ or part of the, the cancer and they get the tissue studies and they work at a pathological level, which agent is going to be beneficial. Obviously, we are not in a position to be doing brain, spinal cord, or peripheral nerve biopsies. When we do, then there's going to be deficits. So we have to do that. Again, that is slowing us down. But I think that there is a lot of adv advocacy for cocktail therapies. And in fact, every time you do a clinical trial now, the prerequisite is you have to be on really steady state. 
and and if you're if you can get access to a darabone, that's fine, and you stay on that, and then you add the, the next medication on top of it, and so I think you'll see more and more of that. The real problem for us is we don't have many medications; we need more. Um, I did have another uh, thing, uh, not to put you on the hot seat, doctor, but um, you know, one thing that we really are are uh, passionate about is that uh, in Alzheimer's, you know, the field has really committed to testing therapies early in the disease stage. And, uh, you know, I think there's, it's, there's definitely a possibility that, you know, approaches would work earlier and not later. And we don't really know uh, if that's happening, you know, with any of the therapies we're excluding now or, or hypotheses we're excluding now. And so it seems like really, really a big deal that we start including pre-symptomatic cohorts, I guess, with biomarker signs or whatever, or, you know, you, you, the doctors can figure that one out, you know, what the inclusion is, but, um, it would, we're in agreement. We're in yeah. agreement. I don't think that's controversial. Um, I think the other thing just to say is that a lot of these trials, this is now for, for patients, as opposed to asymptomatic individuals, the entry criteria can be disease present for two to five years. And I've been in discussions with companies saying, we need to focus on the first few months of the condition. They're saying, well, no, no, that, that slows recruitment down. It becomes far more expensive. We can't do our studies. You need to open it up to everyone. So there's arguments for all sides. Basically, a lot of these come down, a lot of these come down to financial discussions. That's the problem. Totally, I believe that. Uh, there's some wonderful uh, sharing of family stories in the chat. Um, uh, Asunta sh shared about her family having C9 and six family members being lost. And um, Karen sharing about that, yeah, her family was negative for SOD1, positive for C9. Um, yeah. I, uh, well, I, think, I think it's devastating and as clinicians, we don't like it's it's not pleasant discussion and seeing seeing siblings of people you've looked after is very hard looking after children of individuals you've looked after is very hard but yes that's that's what we're all dealing with um that really is all chart was uh was very impressive i i'd never seen or heard of that before about you know, I don't even know what it was showing, but uh, really, <laughs> but that it showed the uh, the biomarker sign. Um, uh, that that was fabulous. Uh, makes me a much bigger fan of really all now. I think. Well, I think the other thing is, well, I remember when we first presented it, so we did the studies in the 90s, and it was very hard to get it through Australian authorities because of the expense. And they said, oh, you you don't have any quality of life data, so it didn't actually go forward. And I remember I was presenting it at a grand round, so general medical grand rounds, and we said, look, the benefits of, at, at, at the lowest end, three to six months, and the oncologist got up and said, if we had something that was you know, showing benefit for three to six months, everyone would be ecstatic, like, that's amazing. And the more and more that we learn about Rilizol, the more benefits it has longer term. And every trial has shown the benefits of Rilizol, and every animal model has done that too. So I think it is it is a very strong medication. The trouble is we haven't been able to replicate it with a similar type of medication to have an even greater effect. So medications that look like Rilizol have been trialed, but they don't seem to have any benefit. So we haven't unlocked really how Rilizol works. Um, Sharon, uh, please go ahead. Hi there. Um, I just have a question about um, which research studies I can be involved in. Hi, I'm, I'm in Australia as well. <laughs> um, I've known I've had the C9 off gene, um, gene since 2012. I've been involved in, me and my family have been involved in lots and lots of studies, like names that come to mind is definitely yours, Dr. Kinnett Kiernan, but also Steve Birchick, Garth Nicholson, Glenda Halliday. Um, so yeah, lots lots of different studies over the years. Um, my father and grandmother both donated their brains. All sorts of things going on there. Most recently, was involved in the Dynad study, but you know you've mentioned issues with funding, and they've lost their funding. <laughs> so I guess at the moment, after having such a long history of being involved in anything and everything that we can, I feel like I'm not involved in anything at the moment. So being someone who's in Australia and can travel to Sydney. Can you tell me what I can be involved in as an asymptomatic carrier? Yeah, well, I think, um, well, firstly, thanks to you and your family for participating in all of those names. We are all linked, so, uh, and we're linked nationally, but then also into the international uh, initiatives. So we've provided samples to Project Mine internationally. 
um, to large initiatives in North America, to the Asia Pacific. So all of those samples are participating in research and all of the tissue samples are available for any clinician or research group to approach through ethics um, and we will provide those samples for the studies. Um, there are ongoing studies both through all of the people that you've mentioned. So I suppose a little bit depends on your own time availability and, and you know, the expenses involved. Generally, most researchers will pay for the, the expenses like in coming to see us and, and transport and, and accommodation. I suppose one interesting thing that is um, on, the, on the discussion is neurofilament uh, levels. And obviously that's a research approach, but I think most people are interested in, in tracking neurofilaments in asymptomatic individuals as are uh, asymptomatic individuals themselves. And then the question is, if there are changes in the neurofilament level, what do we do? Um, that, 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 that's an example of, at this stage, a research study. I suspect that in a few years that will be standard of care, but it's not at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I live in Melbourne, but have travelled to Sydney many times to be involved in things. So, I'll oh, let me know. And and I suppose in Melbourne, yeah. um, Susan Mathers and Paul Talman are part of the sort of national, um, we call it Mind Oz uh, registry and and research approach. Great, thank you. Sharon I, and Dr. Kiernan, are there FTD studies, genetic FTD studies in Australia? Because C9 people can also go to them. Um, I don't know if there is, uh, but um, something to look into, Sharon, as yeah. well. So there's a, we are linked to what's called Frontier, uh, which is particularly John Hodges, Olivia Pigay, and Glenda Halliday, and they run the FTD service. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's been a discussion about therapies for frontotemporal dementia. And I'll, I'll put this discussion out there because it's important that, that everyone um, thinks it through. So part of the discussion is involvement in clinical trials of therapies for frontotemporal dementia. And this was discussed in a panel a bit like this and the overwhelming information coming from, and this is from a one-off experience, but coming from the carers of individuals, you know, husbands and wives, they were not very interested in having a clinical trial. In other words, in prolonging the process that they're going through with their with their partner. And I think that's an important thing to consider too. Well, uh, we definitely are uh, more concerned with uh, ourselves <laughs> and our family members <laughs> than uh, their their spouses. Um, yeah, no, no, so the spouses, the spouses who had the condition, the people who were their husbands and wives, weren't interested in in a clinical yes. trial. No, no, I, 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 I was, I was, I was picking that up. Um, yeah, it does seem crazy that Rizal has never been looked into for C9 FTD. Um, I did yeah, have a question. Um, yeah. That that bump that you saw, just a quick question. That bump that you saw and uh, that leveled off eventually for the the Rizal result. Um, some people have said, oh, maybe it'll lose its, uh, its maybe maybe it'll lose uh, effect, and that's why you shouldn't try it early. So, uh, any thoughts on that? And yeah. Well, what I think is that it's the loss of corticospinal neurons. So in other words, they're decaying and eventually you can't have neuroprotection if there are none left. So that's why the effect's wearing off. And the earlier you start it, absolutely the, the bigger benefit. Um, so it's not, I think, a wearing off. It's that the population of cells who are benefiting from this approach are getting less and less and less as the disease progresses. Uh, very cool, very interesting. Um, you know, there's going to be this discussion on the use of really is all pre symptomatically in September. I really wish you could be there to talk about this because that sounds so fascinating. But maybe uh, I can get some links and can try to uh, seed the seed the discussion with uh, with some interesting things. Um, sure. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kiernan, and and for everyone who's who's here, and uh, for everyone who participates in ALS research, we're, we're so thankful. I don't know if you have any anything to say to, to end it out. Well, I'd just say thanks for uh, bringing the group together. Uh, I know, Jean, you're a great advocate and you've done great work. And as I said, we, we're, we're all in support. Um, and these discussions are very helpful and, and you need more and more advocacy to, to take these critical discussions forward. Luckily, we do have 
a, a greater awareness. I mean, working in this field 10 or 15 years ago, as well as all of the clinical problems, it was just a complete lack of awareness, understanding and support. So I think that the time is, is right for ALS in particular, but ALS FTD and neurodegeneration and I think we're already seeing now the investment, financial investment is coming through in terms of treatments and the discussions you're putting forward are critical and, and we support those, those initiatives. Well, thank you so much and we'll, we'll end uh, for, for the event. Thank you so much again. Thank you.